Let's give a welcome round of applause to Jeff. Um, yeah, thank you. So, so here's the drill. Jeff and I are going to have a conversation, uh, a little fireside chat for, I don't know, a half hour or so, and then I'll open it up to Q&A, and, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, and we'll jump into the, into the conversation. Uh, and it, Jeff, as, as you know, this is uh, like a lot of what you do, and as I say, I, I learned from you. Uh, it's unscripted, and we'll, we'll just have a little bit of fun. Let's talk first about, you know, one thing I, I, I didn't mention, that, that the group, as we think about uh, uh, integrating faith and work, however everyone thinks about it, there's obviously a lot of different traditions and ways to do that. Uh, tell us a bit about your growing up and, and your family. I know your older brother, Mark, who's a, a prominent lawyer, a, a partner uh, in a terrific law firm in, in Philly. Um, tell us about your, your family, because your, your dad was in, in retail, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. And I, I would like to tell you about my journey here. That would be great. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, thank you for the warm welcome. And uh, uh, Jerry, for those uh, beautiful opening remarks, uh, uh, David, of course, many of us in here would, would follow you anywhere, snowy, uh, sub-Arctic uh, weather or whatever, uh, we'd be there. But there are so many friends in this room. I'm worried, Jerry, to make sure I have to come up with something that hasn't been heard before. But Betsy, thanks for coming out. Thank you for dragging her out here. She didn't know where she was going, and now you got her stuck here. Uh, but, but Betsy is a, as an old friend, Mitch Dickey hiding in the back. Uh, uh, we have uh, Marshall Cooper uh, is here from Chief Executive Magazine. Or Wayne Cooper is here from Chief Executive Magazine. Uh, we, uh, there's uh, uh, some Yaleys even in the room. Uh, where's, where's Hank Higdon hiding? We need Mr. Higdon. Up. Yeah, so the, uh, the last, it was a 67 football for Yale. Uh, it was the last time we had a good season, I think, that uh, he, was, he was there. I guess Undefeated, we don't, we untied. Don't want to throw, throw around the dates, but, uh, and uh, 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 Grant's from the, the Touche Ross days. Of course, we'd love to catch up when we get a chance into some of that. Doug, my old uh, MBA uh, classmate, uh, folks scattered around the room that I'm thrilled to be with. But one of the things uh, that I just saw moments ago, uh, Dave Mullins, one of the watchwords we had back you know, I'm, I've been at Yale now for 15 years, but some accuse me of operating behind enemy lines because uh, I was at, at HBS for 18 years. Uh, well, actually at Harvard, at least in general, for 18 years. And Dave, remember we used to always say, don't go, and we both suffered this, don't go off to uh, student events after the alcohol, right? <laughs> well, here, because bad things would happen. And, uh, you know, here we are. I remember, uh, I should uh, clarify, Grant, it was not your firm, but another uh, firm, Arthur Anderson. I went off, it was the last time I did an after, after drinks uh, talk, and uh, three of the partners actually collapsed into each other and flattened the table. They said, what's going to, it was in St. Charles, it was an old monastery, what's going to happen? So I thought, I really can't do one of these again. Uh, and, uh, but who could say no to David? I'm always worried about with the alcohol. Then with Jerry's warm-up pitch, uh, he said so many nice things. Uh, in fact, I even started to distinctly dislike myself after a while as he went on. Uh, so thank you for all that. Is, uh, we have a tape you said from my wife so she can, she can hear that somebody else. Uh, but I, as Jerry was going on, and he started to say these nice things, uh, and then he uh, quickly reminded everybody, say, though, remember, we actually do have... Uh, some pretty important evenings, though, as well, like Mike Ullman last time and Ann Mulcahy <laughs> coming up next time. I thought, all right, well, that's a pretty good crowd to be sandwiched between. I remember that it was actually 17 years ago this week, I don't think this night, that I did Tur Ted Turner's last After Drinks retreat. They were being swallowed up into the Time Warner world at the time. And uh, Ted did this, something like this. He went around the room, talked about who's there. And, th and then he asked me to come up. But Jerry, he didn't enunciate as clearly as you did. And it, 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 it all came flashing back to me now as after drinks, how bad this was, is he kind of staggered up to the podium and he, he, he introduced, uh, I started to walk up, he, no, he motioned me to sit down again and then he brought up his, uh, his, his then wife, Jane Fonda, who went off and critiqued everybody, the people in the room, by the way, there are about 200 people that uh, all claimed to be direct reports to Ted. I think maybe they were, but <laughs> their titles were like vice chairman on up. And uh, I think the average age was around 23 or so, except, <laughs> except for the uh, CNN people who were grown-ups, but Cartoon Network was... And, and uh, the second time I walked up, because he told me to go sit down, because after Jane offended everybody, veins bulging at the neck, I thought, oh, it can't get any worse, David. <laughs> then the next person who came, I, I came up again, he motioned me to go sit down. He asked, uh, he asked uh, oh, Larry King, who is a Turner employee, to come up. So any of the CEO name-dropping you're putting up there for credibility, he talked about how many kings and queens and popes, he had breakfast with that that morning alone. And so he went and sat down and then uh, I thought, well, I'm not walking up there. No, no, really come up. And, and then he changed his mind, told me to go sit down again. And he pulled up another Turner employee 
who uh, was in the Castle Rock Division. Uh, actually, he built the Castle Rock Division, sold it to Turner, and was very successful. Uh, and this was uh, Billy Crystal. I thought, oh, wow. You know, there was that, like, one opening joke that I'd rehearsed. <laughs> to. So I, I sat down again, and uh, he said, no, no, now it really is your turn. And as I walked up there, I, I realized it actually could get even worse than all that had preceded it. As I looked out in the room, there's another Turner guy uh, who was at the Castle Rock Division. It was the number one show on TV on Thursday nights at the time. Castle Rock produced it and used to sell it to NBC on Thursday nights. Any guess who that might have been? Yeah, see, my students have no idea who that was. Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> Jerry said Sonnenfeld clearly, but I hope nobody else is expecting what, the way he enunciated <laughs> after drinks, uh, the way Ted Turner came off. They all were expecting Jerry Seinfeld, not Jerry Seinfeld, Bill, Billy Crystal, Larry King. If you can imagine a set of faces even more disappointed than yours right now, but you Jeff, if seen anyone theirs, could uh, pull it off, <laughs> you could pull it off. It was, it was pretty hard. So that was that's some of the journey here. And I, I should say, though, that it is a spiritual journey. I thought I was going to be late because I, I was supposed to leave at 4 o'clock. I, of course, left at uh, 4.30 to meet you at 5.30. Oh, yeah. The merit was clear. 95 was clear. It was like, you know, the Red Sea parted. Proof of God's come, existence. Proof, right? it, this, is a, this is a blessed, Mike Oldman told me it would be a blessed event, and sure enough, it was. And, and we saw what the stock market did in your honor today. So, right, uh, uh, exactly. so congratulations, David. So, yeah, so thanks. Look, look, I, t take a minute, loop back. Uh, if more I, of a journey. You more reflection than that. But tell me, you're, you're just mom and dad briefly, and I want to go into business stuff. So y your mom was an immigrant, wasn't she? And, yeah, she and, was. And came uh, from a pretty tough background. Yes. Wow. Gosh, you've done your homework. Yeah. Is, uh, my, my mother uh, and father are very strong spiritual anchors uh, for me. My mom was uh, born in, um, in a, uh, a shtetl outside of, she always called it, uh, uh, in Russia. Uh, we now would know it as Ukraine. And uh, hopefully, if she were with us today, she would recognize that really is the free, independent country of Ukraine, not Russia. But she saw herself as, as, as Russian uh, outside Kiev. And the, Programs were pretty vicious, and uh, she had some. Uh, she was only four or five years old when she left, uh, but with recreated memory of hearing all relatives talk about the, the slaughters uh, that they would witness. Uh, I think she started to think that she remembered seeing all. The, maybe she saw, does remember it, uh, what a four-year-old could remember. But it was pretty it's horrible, horrible event. memories in, in, in getting here. I mean, she still could. She until her last day could recount what it was like being on. Uh, the, the, her, her boat, the Cedric, that got her uh, here ultimately, which was part of the White Star Line, and she was very proud of the, hmm. proud that it was the Titanic <laughs> Line. <symbolism>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, uh, and came to the country and uh, did pretty well. She was one of the um, computer girls. If you saw the PBS series that came out two years ago, a bunch of really uh, smart girls from Philadelphia's public uh, girls, talented, uh, gifted school for talented girls, uh, uh, girls high, that were doing the Parabola. She was very interested in math and uh, was quite good at working with. Uh, uh, at Penn, they had the ENIAC, the you sure. know the the first computer, which could you know probably uh, uh, do uh, you know, something twice the size of this room. Yeah, exactly. But what it took to do what what uh, uh, simple calculations. But they were and, and working. Did she kind of like raise you uh, with, with so the traditions that, that she grew up with, or or was religion really not part of your, your household? No, it's very much a part of the household. She was a, a big believer in uh, tradition and believing yeah. in something and bigger. She a lot of times when you suffer adversity, she at the 26 year old as gymnast as she was became uh, a, a quadriplegic paralyzed uh, of four limbs uh, mm -hmm. with a really bad form of crippling uh, chronic rheumatoid arthritis. And probably three quarters of this room have some form of uh, arthritis, but rheumatoids are really bad. And we, these degenerative diseases, you know, the, the, the treatment at the time was a lot of convalescence and, uh, and painkillers, which were addictive mm -hmm. and convalescence would lead to atrophy. Mm -hmm. Her belief was you have to get, to get out there and be a part of the world and force yourself against it. And she actually, uh, she did, uh, she did quite well uh, for the next several decades. And my dad had some bad uh, uh, heart conditions. So there were times where I was running the family clothing, clothing store. Uh, it was young men's apparel. I look down right now because I have always <laughs> have this nightmare. I'm colorblind, as was my father. And when my father went into the business. In the clothing business. <laughs> in the, is the men's clothing used to be very simple when after the Second World War he came out. He was in Wharton and his mother-in-law convinced him to leave and go and open up a shop and be a business person instead and he had a couple shops and it really uh, you, you used to have to, a, a $2.99 uh, a work shirt and a $4.99 dress shirt and you had you know cuff chinos and uh, dungarees you didn't have all these jeans and 
So suddenly, in the mid early 60s, the whole mod Carnaby Street explosion where men became peacocks was a little <laughs> too much for him and for me. We had to sell all these octagonal granny glasses and uh, these uh, uh, sleeveless, you know, vested suits and the Eisenhower jackets, these Nehru jackets and things. Uh, it was uh, really a problem, and I, I still worry because uh, being colorblind, uh, it's really, you know, a man in a store. Just so you know, you look marvelous. Do I, <laughs> a, ma a man going in a clothing store often looks around for somebody. It could be a, a wife, a girlfriend, a saleswoman. If there's nobody else there, they go to a sales guy, and uh, and they just don't want to look. Silly, you know, a woman doesn't want <laughs> patterns to go the wrong way or look out of shape. A guy doesn't want people to laugh at him. I put together these great combinations of suits. The color didn't matter. When you get to the haberdashery, I blow all credibility. I put, you know, and you know, somebody had to come and save me because these things just looked awful mixed together. So, so. so here's a little secret. I, I'm actually not too good with colors either. And my, my wife has these little labels on the inside. So when I'm traveling, I know what matches. <laughs> oh, you do. I was afraid to sit in these stools because I have safety clips, safety <laughs> pins I put on here. The socks. I go and get a row of socks, and I think they're all the same color. They're not. They're, so before we go to your adult life, is it really true that you were an Eagle Scout, a Boy Scout? Uh, yes, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, thanks uh, for asking. I was an Eagle Scout, and you mentioned John Whitehead. I'm a, a distinguished Eagle Scout, which are uh, astronauts, uh, presidents, and then yeah. me somewhere. It's just, uh, somebody who hasn't done something horrific as an Eagle Scout. You know, every time an Eagle Scout does something wrong, you know, it winds up as a big headline somewhere. So if you manage not to do anything wrong, they come back and reward you later, but I think that's a, a great organization too for thinking about something bigger than yourself. My mother's dedication, as we mentioned, it was very, my parents were very serious about religion, but also about community service. Often it was failing causes and losing candidates, but it's still the spirit was there. Yeah. Well, and that's always been an anchor to Judaism, hasn't it? That it's, it's something bigger than yourself, being active in the world and trying to shape and form and reform the world. Isn't that's it? sort of been, you know, some of the, the ways I think uh, where there's an ecumenical approach that comes together yeah. is that you know, as Judaism is unsure of the afterlife, you can get a lot of controversy going among uh, rabbis and scholars uh, about what qualities of the afterlife, what they are, where it might be. And there is no, some. Jews will tell you that they don't, but there's a strong belief about God's kingdom being here on earth, at least yeah. a part of it, and, uh, and that so that there's a, a sense of sadaka, that sense of uh, a word for, um, for giving back, that uh, it, it was very important, uh, as you know, both in the, in the, in the Bible and ampl amplified uh, uh, um, elsewhere, often in the Talmud, that you're always, always supposed to leave about uh, a, a quarter to an eighth to a quarter of your field unplowed and to leave that for the, the needy. And, the gleaning, and, yeah. 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 That's often on the, the, the perimeter. And that, that sense of giving back was uh, always uh, really, really big in the family. Yeah. And so let's, let's, with that as your backdrop, the thinking about giving back and thinking about others, how does teaching fit into that? Did you always want to be a professor? Because by age 26, you're teaching at Harvard B School. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary, Jeff. Well, with parents that were sick a lot, and I uh, was active, as you mentioned, the Boy Scouts and things like that, and uh, so, like probably uh, the half of this room or more class president, editor of the school paper and all that kind of thing, and football lacrosse, uh, is I still, then after hours, would have to get off to uh, go to our clothing store and uh, when, when the one or the other or both parents were in the hospital to get the tailoring ready and work on the payroll and things like that. I always saw business, not so much as venal in an ideological sense, but just tedious and I wanted to sort of <laughs> do something more uplifting to get away from it and with parents sick so much I thought I wanted to be a physician. The Philadelphia hospitals, the urban hospitals they were often in, even teaching hospitals, a certain institutional callousness that did not endear the, uh, that lifestyle to me but I was working at Mass General Hospital, well uh, so the Harvard undergraduate in the midst of organic chemistry which um, uh, admittedly was not my finest uh, grade <laughs> uh, but I was surviving. And being colorblind hurt again. You had these little precipitates. You had to separate a mellow yellow from a right. pale yellow. I couldn't <laughs> yeah. see these things. So, uh, And I was rowing crew, which was a lot more gratifying. So I remember one day just sweeping all the test tubes into the trash can and deciding to reinvent myself. <laughs> but David, I took a very easy course at the Harvard Business School then that our friend Jay Lorsch was teaching, Jay and Paul Lawrence. It was like human behavior and organizations. And I thought, well, this is great. I mean, I'm working in Mass General. I love the whole institutional life. Here there's a sense of pride. Uh, almost an entrepreneurial pride in a, in a big uh, healthcare institution. And, and, and uh, it, it seems that uh, uh, sometimes uh, Betsy would agree even big healthcare institutions can work. And this, the Mass General was one of those, those that really worked. I, I like institute, I care more about this than the medicine. And so, and then I was taking this course, Human Behavior and Organizations, 
frankly, is an easy course while taking the, all the uh, organic, inorganic, and biochem courses. I thought, wow, I can't believe you get course credit for this stuff. <laughs> I shouldn't admit this to you. And that there's actually fields of inquiry, and I was taking behavioral science that I was studying in the arts and sciences school there and bringing them up to date, because there's a sense of, uh, when there's a religious belief in, uh, I shouldn't use that term, but a, a, a mystical belief in uh, the case study method to an extreme, sometimes people are reluctant to introduce the known knowledge. And I'm sure David used to be frustrated at times you were teaching uh, basic accounting, which David was teaching high level finance, but uh, trying to reintroduce uh, and reinvent the double entry bookkeeping. You should sort of accept the fact that Medici's got us a little further along and we could pick up. So it, even in behavioral science, it's not all cliches. You know, you hear a cliche that says opposites attract, and then you hear a cliche that says birds of a feather. Well, you know what, they're, they're both right, but in different circumstances, one's operative, one isn't. We kind of know roughly when that is. I would bring that into this human behavior and organizations easy class I was taking. I realized I'm being treated like I'm a Nobel laureate for taking the, so wow, this field could, so I got into it and I, I loved getting into this field. And I realized that not only you could have a, a nice quality of life uh, doing this, so, uh, and I wound up uh, switching uh, in my uh, senior year, uh, and, which I thought would be much to my parents' horror from medicine to this field of organizational behavior. Uh, oh, and I'm OB doctor, I think, in one way or another, but, uh, <laughs> but it, uh, it yeah. uh, turned out to be a, a great calling. Yeah. So interesting to use the word calling. It, it sort of has a sense of a meaning and purpose involved, in it, and you clearly are passionate about what you do. You're not just earning a paycheck. You're, you're fired up about what you do. One thing that intrigues me, one of the first papers, if I remember correctly, that you wrote as a young scholar in your 20s, didn't you do an interview? And in some ways it goes to this, uh, uh, one of the things we talk about in the organization, how do we stay, how do we make sure we're not a statistic? How is a, as an Eagle Scout, and I'm one too, how do we make sure we're not the next headline of doing something wrong? Didn't you write a paper that explored, you interviewed uh, white collar felons when they came out of prison, asking them, why did you do something you knew was wrong? Do you remember that? And what, what did you find? Is there any wisdom still from that today? I'm, I'm amazed at your research. Uh, we, we did no prep. I, I'd like to say I set him up to ask the right questions, but uh, is, uh, I, I <coughs> Maybe we're twin sons of different mothers, who knows? <laughs> yes. yeah, please let me know when you guys start getting bored, because uh, this is a kind of a re revenge of the nerd. I'm always asking the questions and throwing out the, uh, the, the grenades. I'm so, loving it. Uh, so if I'm twisting my wedding ring, it's only because I'm very nervous never being in this spot. Uh, is, it's true. Uh, I Frankly, there was, um, as there is today a resurgent spirit of corporate social responsibility, the language was a little bit different, but there's a great interest in that, even at the West Point of capitalism back when I was there in, uh, initially in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. People were talking about it, and I thought, well, I care about the social impact too. And the more I read about it, though, for a room that's filled with people interested in one form or another of business ethics, I have to tell you that candidly, I, I'd read through some of these cliched speeches, ethics speeches, and they'd seem, by business leaders, that they were so platitudinous that the only meat that there had been had been the meat and the meal that proceeded to talk. And that <laughs> I thought somebody needed to study this stuff systematically, that there are authentic discretions, and that's not just used. If you really want to know something which is e even worse than, than tedious academic lectures, it's, it was when uh, those of you all uh, as business leaders come to campus and want to sound even more cerebral than the academics and don't give us the brilliance of your actual experience, which is really the decisions of what you do in the world of action are so much more interesting than trying to use neologisms. Ma neologism, as you probably know, is a made up word for made up words, <laughs> is, uh, is instead of using that kind of language is to talk from your experience. So I thought they're not talking about experience. There's bad stuff and good stuff. Exactly. We're grouping it all together. I need to go out there and learn about this. So I went out and uh, I, I uh, I talked to people who went to prison for price fixing, and, and the industry was uh, folding cartons. I thought, uh, I'm just going to go to them in prison or as they come out and talk to them. 75 of them, some of them were CEOs, some of them were regional sales executives and things. They were big companies, uh, and trying to understand, I, this is the same industry that had been hit. If you may remember, those of the business historians or antitrust attorneys in the room, there was a big electrical contractors conspiracy case in the 1960s outside of Philadelphia. That, uh, Alice Chalmers, G, and others, people went to prison. But the second biggest one was with these paper companies. Only, it turned out it was the same companies over and over again, multi-wall bags, corrugated containers. How could they keep not learning, and now it's folding cartons, how could they not learn from experience? So I talked to them, and I went in with a young person's sense of idealistic hostility about the, and you'd meet with them, and they'd say, you know, 
uh, and, this, and if they weren't the CEO, the CEOs would point fingers and shame at them as if they had nothing to do with this. You realize they're getting mixed mis signals. They're incentive systems. They were driven on, on often on price level and things that were not really built around uh, the right margins that you think they should have been measured by. So some of the incentives were misleading. There were, uh, there were multitudes of trade associations that would put them together cheek and jowl. They would just meet and in uh, customer rooms and they'd look at the farmers and the shoemakers or others at that time who they felt had uh, the price advantage and they were probably getting some price protection that they had grassroots support and legislatures and things to be e exempted from what might be antitrust for others. And they, they said, we're a dirty industry. We put sulfur dioxide in the air and we, uh, we, we uh, cut down trees, whatever it is, people don't like us. So we have to do it on our own. We're just gonna keep these little mom and pop shops together Anybody back then on a passbook savings account was probably making more money than, a, than a, one of these folding carton companies were. And they said, look at our customers. It's Colgate and P&G, and I know there's some alums from, uh, from both those companies here in the room. Uh, but they have this monopsony buying power, and we are, you know, we are these little guys. How can we be the antitrust uh, villains here? We're this so, highly- so is it rationalizing that they- It's a rationalizing, and the economists would say, well, the likelihood of having antitrust problems in this highly competitive industry are very low. It, true, the likelihood of success is low because somebody's gonna break the cartel. But the temptation to try it was very high, and that's when they get in trouble for that. And they could justify it. So I'd meet these people, and I'd see their pictures active in the church, and the Boy Scouts, Little Leagues, and their kids on the pictures on their desk. And there were these Babbitt-type figures in their communities who, in their minds, thought that they were not convicted. They shouldn't have been convicted felons. And you could understand their point of view. So I can't understand it, in a, in a, and I'm not justifying what they did. They, they say, isn't this the American way? You say, well, no, it's not. A free market competition. But, but you see, what's their justification? Because the prisons are filled with innocent people. Why do they think they were innocent? And that's when I came to understand the larger. So that's, yeah, they, sorry you asked. Huh? Nobody's yeah. ever asked this before. <laughs> uh, is, uh, but it's and, a relevant question, because uh, when I think of when I when I teach ethics uh, at, at Princeton, one of the opening slides I show is I look through different Princeton University alumni who have all gone to jail. That's so why it happens. You need it, to understand and, the and driving And they're forces. no different than you and me. They're smart, they mean well, they grew up in, let's assume, a good home. They may have been part of a religious community regardless which tribe they were in. And yet, and yet, somehow really smart people find themselves doing things later. We go, what were they and thinking? You could see that play out before your eyes for, for years until the last three years is on The Apprentice, not to, not to disparage the Donald. Uh, he's very impressive in many ways. Uh, but still, the, the premise Donald. of that show is, of course, an elimination game. Uh, it, is, uh, it's, it is like a musical chairs or a gong show thing. But they would used to take reasonable young people, I see, and they'd put them into unreasonable situations. Uh, and people would be fixated on seeing how such unethical behavior would, would uh, seem to lead to triumphs. Yeah. And, and the model of the show was, the person who won wasn't somebody who beat some, some, some very difficult overseas competitor arising over the horizon or some, some supplier who's now uh, vertically integrated into your market or something, or, or horizontally, rather, or, or, some, um, or, or some great goods to society you're bringing that was needed. No, it was how have you trashed your coworker, hmm. that the, the, the person who wins is the person who destroys their team. That's the model of a great leadership of ethical risk. And through deception, thievery, uh, a lot of uh, uh, misogyny and things, so this is bizarre. But then you realize that this basically is like Lord of the Flies. But people read, you remember Lord of the Flies. And I used yeah. to require my students back at Harvard to read Lord of the Flies and uh, Enemy of the People with Ibsen and things. I've, I've given up on that. MBAs are just <laughs> a little too hard to push. You could try again, I think, maybe in shorter works. But uh, 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 Man as for All Seasons, so you have yeah. a man of the cloth yeah. to take a look at the. Uh, it was hard going as the people who challenged the system, but I think yeah. it was important to, to yeah. with the Trump show as a, as a reminder how you can, you can reproduce unethical behavior. Uh, I made the mistake of, of though, writing articles in the Wall Street Journal critiquing the Trump show and going on Dateline, and then I started hearing from him and his lawyers, and that's a whole long story. If you'd like to hear it, I can tell you. <laughs> Je Jeff is not backwards about being forwards, but... Um, <laughs> So, so let me pick up on something. You, you, you sort of think of the roots and some of what GLF thinks about as the roots of what's faith, tradition, whatever it is, how that can shape and inform us later not to fall into this, this uh, justifying behavior or trash or, or destroy other people. Uh, there was a, a group when I was at Yale, uh, some of your students uh, at the time, they had a, a Christian fellowship group that got together once a week or whatever and did a Bible study and talked. And, and they asked me to, to work with them and, and to help uh, think about the group. And I suggested, well, your business students build 
your own business plan. And they came up with the idea of hosting a conference, which Hank Higdon came and talked at, and you came to talk to. They called it the Christian MBA Conference. They end up now, it's uh, now institutionalized. It's been running for about eight or nine years. It meets at the Yale Club in, in New York. There are about four or 500 kids who come from all over the country. And they're trying to hold on to their, and it could be, they could be Jewish, they could, but this happens, these are Christian. But they're trying to connect the dots between what they hear in their Sabbath and what they do in the work world. As, as you think with your friends, the people you know, and, and in your own life, how do you, how do you think people connect the dots between their, these deep, rich meaning sources uh, and then the pressures of the day? It's hard. There is such a, a, um, an anxiety about talking about spirituality yeah. uh, in educational circles, and it's only gotten you know, harder in some ways. You know, we're not talking about introducing Sharia law on campus. Uh, speech but, zones and everything else. But like still there's this that uh, losing David uh, from, from Yale was a, a, b a big blow. So I'm, I'm happy to be luring you back to, to class in a few weeks, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Looking forward uh, to it. That David will be there with uh, Enron whistleblower Sharon Watkins, somebody actually in this neighborhood who uh, even before Sharon uh, was uh, uh, even an earlier whistleblower. There's a guy of all, a guy named Dan Scotto, who was the first um, uh, person, to, he was the head of all equity research at Paribas, who came out with a hold recommendation, which of course in those days meant sell. And uh, he was there. He was their top energy analyst, in addition to being the equity research. And uh, one of the most undemocratic things in American society is when, in certain professions, you have to sign uh, employment agreements that all disputes are resolved by binding arbitration, which is ludicrous. You, you can use sheer gossip uh, as your uh, evidence uh, record for binding arbitration. If the lawyers in the room, if anybody who believe in it, I still would argue you're wrong. It's a very bad practice. There's no appeal unless you can prove outright fraud. Uh, you, it's, so it's a, this guy was really back-channeled quite badly, uh, but as you're here, there with him, David, these people and others, there's a, a, there's a prominent person from a, an er, a much earlier period of Citigroup, but we'll have, uh, and we'll have a hidden whistleblower in the room who made some ethical concessions and a case study we'll talk about, and then we'll eventually reveal him after the class trashes him and talks about how he got seduced into it, is that their spiritual anchoring was very helpful. Mm -hmm. For those uh, who took a courageous stand, and you know, Sharon maybe wished she stepped even earlier and louder than she did, because she was a, an internal, not an external whistleblower yeah. and things, but she is very open about uh, she, and she'll talk about uh, the, uh, we have a, a, a board member in the room here who was on the MCAI board, uh, but in the good days uh, mm -hmm. in recovery. But the, the whistleblowers at, uh, at MCI, at, at uh, Enron, WorldCom, and others who, uh, who stood out, uh, they had some anchoring, something larger than themselves. They had some basis for moral courage, and I think that we're nervous about it. You guys had the courage, of course, tonight to open with, with, with Jerry's uh, and opening with a, with, a, with a blessing, and you were, of course, drawing an anchoring back. I think it's, I think it's important to do that, and we just we don't do that enough, and it's uh, hard to talk about it. Our CEO summits, and candidly, David, I, I close with you, and uh, people overwhelmingly are pleased. There's always going to be one or two cynics, of course academics, who come up to me afterwards and complain, <laughs> what are you doing bringing the spirituality and this educational thing? But David, uh, as you know, and, and maybe to some of you to a fault, is very ecumenical. The issues he's raising, uh, you shouldn't think there would be a, a fair-minded person on the planet that would object to it. But it is a very tough act to follow, I will admit, so we tend to close with you, <laughs> although you have some, <laughs> some spry comments along the way. But I think it's important to, yeah. to bring out a, a spiritual backbone, a spiritual overview uh, as we're going on these things. If you really you know, want to push further is that with, uh, I think we've all had some uh, unhappiness in our childhood. In my case, it was just the, Ill the, uh, the perpetual illness of both of my parents, is they never were raging into the darkness. They were big believers, uh, and my father would often quote from the, the book of Job, which is, you know, to some, uh, some have trouble with the book of Job because, of, of course, the, the bottom line of the, the core part of Job, as opposed to the interpolations on either end, is you know, uh, we don't always understand the suffering, and Job's friends were always there to say, this is retribution, this is, this is punishment for the way you've lived, and he was supposed to be this virtuous, honest man, and the horrible things that happened to him, why was it he was screaming, how could you do this to me, and then as if there's a simple Deuteronomic equation that you would do this and I give you that, well, you know, and God, as you recall, comes out the end, said, you know, basically, where's that contract, where are you? Uh, you of dust and ashes when I created the universe and the place. What? Who are you to tell me what the rules are and things? And that's a certain existential leap of faith there that uh, 
you know, whether or not it's uh, Martin Buber or Graham Greene or whomever you would say, look at, that you have to figure out how do you put the meaning into something you don't completely understand. And the religion really helps bring that. And with the suffering we had in my uh, childhood and things, my father said, don't rage at the night and the darkness. At Job, and ironically, at Bar Mitzvah, or maybe it wasn't ironic, maybe it was providential, <laughs> was that what is you that read? my Haftorah portion no was, was Job. Wow. And wow. Uh, wow. I was, so I, I love that, and that turns out when uh, we've had as many of you in this room, and to some I'm familiar with some of them in the room, and uh, setbacks along the way, it, it turns out that uh, the book of, of Job, or if you ever read uh, Rabbi Christians where bad things happen to good people, is a, a, a lot of that is heavily anchored in the a book of Job, is is that the will to go on tomorrow, if, if somebody who's struggling with their faith and trying to understand uh, divinity, if they trying to believe in something they don't see, what do you see is tomorrow, is the, is the belief in the tomorrow, it's the cynicism, or you remember Man's Search for Meeting, uh, logotherapy, Viktor Frankl and all, is that he argued the people who made it through the concentration camps as, uh, were the people who, maybe for creating a fiction, that there's, a, there's a, a reason to believe in tomorrow, there's a reason to go on, there'll be a life after this, and that's what's, I think, so important. Not to be so liturgical, I'm sorry. No, I, no, that's, I, I that's, at, that's a space where we think about it. Dan, would you mind teeing up the, the second video, the Ariana Huffington video? Uh, so what you're about to see is, um, and you'll recognize this, Jeff, I don't know the date of it, but Ariana Huffington is interviewing you and Bill George. Uh, Bill George, you'll recall, is the just highly regarded uh, retired chairman and CEO of Medtronics. And, and also, thinner than I think I look in this video, and hopefully <laughs> even now, but I don't think I'm going to like this video. I know that period. That was me emulating the late Elvis. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I've been this for so many years, but what is interesting is that there seems to be a kind of tipping point. Because yeah. in the post this volume. year, for example, um, you saw suddenly all these sessions around mindful leadership. You saw um, a Buddhist monk, you know, Matthew Ricard, you know, walking by teaching meditation to CEOs. You saw Mark Williams, a professor of clinical psychology from Oxford, talking about mindfulness. So, Bill, tell us a little bit about what do you see as this kind of critical mass tipping point around this issue, around them in American corporations? Well, Ariane and I, you'll recall, we were together doing a session with the young global leaders, and they were really caught up in it. But I think now we're seeing many more American corporations here locally in Minneapolis. We have General Mills has been a pioneer with mindful leadership, Target, Cargill, and the West Coast. You have eBay and Genentech and, and Google, of course, has been a real pioneer. And on the East Coast, you have Aetna, who uh, uh, Mark Bertarelli has been uh, doing actually studies on this. So I see it's happening in the corporate world. So one reason it's happening, it's going to improve your long-term bottom line. I can't speak to quarterly results, but, but I'll tell you, you it's going to improve the long-term. You heard Bill George say pray. I can't imagine the Huffington Post would allow anything on there that praying counts for meditation. Oh my God, are you serious? We have a fantastic <laughs> religion section yeah. where we yeah. cover prayer, where it's we cover... The for the people still Every... swinging the, the guns and, oh. and religion. There's absolutely no, right. no difference between okay. prayer and I'm gonna, meditation. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to look. No difference at look. all. Jeff, do you buy into this? Uh, you know, believe it or not, I do. I often come <clears throat> in as a cynic in the new, new thing of, of fads, and I don't think that's what's going on here. Uh, you, 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 of course, we all remember the, you know, the, the art of Japanese management and everybody getting on to uh, Kaizen uh, practices. And uh, there's a, a book an hour coming out on, on corporate purpose these days and the empowerment issues and uh, quality of work life issues that sometimes get cheap in the, <clears throat> in the way they're handled. The, the, uh, the, the, the whole, uh, you know, Esalam self-directed, uh, mind-expanding uh, uh, things we've done in the 60s, something different here. And it's important that this not just be classified with the wisdom of the East. There's a lot of this in the West, too. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre in the 1950s was warning us about the mindless happiness of a stone and that we need to somehow get perspective. There's a, a lot of the great companies that Bill and, and Ariane have talked about. Uh, you know, you add to the list of General Motors in Bill's own hometown, uh, General Mills, rather, of course, uh, as well as companies as, such as Google and, and others that are but perhaps, Jeff, uh, Jeff, uh, you know, more cutting edge in terms of technology and style. So on, on page 72, on the lower right corner of Bill George's book, Authentic Leadership, he briefly mentions that he was part in the Twin Cities of a Bible study that meant, uh, met once a week or once a month, I can't remember. Uh, uh, Ken Melrose from Toro, a lot of other iconic people, Greg Page from Cargill, were all are 
part of that. That was the th one of these anchors. Pick up on that conversation. What, what, what do you see? I, I think that's great. I think it's great for people to be proud of their own traditions, too, while they do it. There was, uh, the thing that worried me is that when we, uh, as a new approach comes out, that there's a rush to package it so quickly and put it in blister packs up by the cash register and sell it as <laughs> generically. And that's what worried me about yeah. the, the purpose movement, the quality of work-life movement, or the... Uh, uh, of course, the, uh, the re-engineering move, whatever it was, the, there's a lot of logic to these things as they come out with good sense, innovations. And this is an area where we look at, at, at spirituality in the workplace. I worry about it becoming co uh, commercialized and blister pack formed so much that people, uh, especially in my line of work, were defining it as if it's from the East, it's better. That somehow something which is coming from a, a, a Christian Jewish or Middle Eastern or other tradition yeah, that's old hat. We need to understand something. And, and they're great Eastern traditions. But um, I remember, you know, D David, I, back, I hate to keep bothering you on this, so uh, I should bother my old classmate, uh, but he's fallen asleep on me here from it. <laughs> you remember, we had it in 1978, there was a unit on Japan in everything we did. It was right. Japanese finance, Japanese production. If, the Jap if our trading partners did, it was the right thing to do. And all those bestseller books on Japanese magic, there was great innovations in there, but there's one excellent review of Type Z organizations and things that came out at the time uh, by a guy named uh, Andrew Hacker, I think wrote the review in the New York Times. It comes back to me now. He said, do you remember that? He was a, a, a professor at, I think, Queens College, I don't know if he's alive in New York, in New York. but he said that these are basically um, uh, sake, uh, that these are, uh, th that it's gallo wine in sake bottles. Uh, and that Elton Mayo, who was a great philosopher, uh, uh, a hard business school philosopher of the, of the assembly line of sorts, is that, uh, that just we recast it, and sometimes in an Eastern panache, it doesn't mean that n maybe uh, it's got to be foreign to be right, and doesn't mean that it's wrong that if it's foreign too, but that we try it's to look in our own backyards, understand in our own backyards. And I do think that was kind of the message. It's going to be too complicated to get into here. I had never seen this clip. Uh, you could take that large face down whenever you'd like, by the way. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, is, but you did notice as we developed the theme there that the future has turned around on all markets from negative to positive. So, uh, <laughs> so I want to move into another area that, that I just so admire the work you've done that, that most people are all interested in, how do I be successful? And you've almost inverted that to say, what happens when people fail, uh, whether of their own making or they were uh, they got shafted by organizational, and, and you've been in a situation once where people made false accusations about you. And in the end, the courts heard you out and, and your name was fully vindicated, but you've been on the receiving end of something uh, that was unjust and, and unfair. Uh, you, you wrote a book called uh, uh, Firing Back, uh, which picks up a little bit on that. But before we go to that, Jeff, could you show the other, or sorry, Dan, the other uh, clip that's just a short one. Uh, it's talking about failure, and how do we think about failure? And, and in the context of what GLF thinks about, how does one's faith tradition help one think in new ways about failure? Would you mind showing that, Dan? And now you have to, there we go. Create your dream with success television. The most important point is to consider good. failure as a liberating a more opportunity. Volume. Too often we consider failure an end. It's the beginning. It's the time where you somehow have a punctuation in life where you realize it's a great time to take a break and move to something new. But with true heroic leadership is not defined by being on a success spiral where you're on one of these uh, conveyor belts forever. But great leaders, they start out, there's a call to greatness, they go out and slay some dragons. And all the folklore and mythology, any great movie that you've seen, and surely the reality of business folk heroes, they slay these dragons, they're off into a great success syndrome, and then something happens. They get, they, they fail, a company falls apart. H. Ross Perot, the investment banks that he bought, uh, fell apart on him. Henry Ford, the first, created two car companies that failed before he ultimately created Ford Motor Company. But it's their resilience from life's adversity that creates that transcendent greatness where they realize now they can really do something for society, for the business world, something larger than just going along that normal conveyor belt of life where you're not really too sure if your name is hyphenated with an institution that employed you, is it you who made that world great or did somehow you help uh, just get carried along by fate? Now you know that actually you can be larger than fate, that you can somehow change the world. And it's the liberating quality of having failed that is perhaps one of the most important qualities of both of resilience, but of truly being a heroic leader. Create your dreams. So, How did you ever find that? 
<laughs> carefully. <laughs> so uh, in a moment, we'll go to Q&A, but I, I, let's take a moment. To tell me a bit about failure and what, what words of wisdom, in the context of what we think about here, would you put forward about failure and how that paradoxically painful though it is when we're in the middle of it later can maybe even be life-giving is what you suggested. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, it really is uh, a, um, a major theme in, in literature that you see, but also just in reality that um, uh, we often uh, you know, present our, our leaders as, as, as perfect, as angelic, and, and when they're not, we savage them. But um, just given the setting, thinking of uh, the first king of the Israelites, you know, they were disappointed, as you know, that the, the elders were upset that the judges were caught up, if you can imagine this in politics and this <laughs> or that, and judges weren't governing well, that they needed a, a, a unitar unified command. So uh, um, we had a great prophet who went out to help find the shepherd, and mm -hmm. uh, sure enough, and okay. Saul turned out not to be so perfect, and, uh, and God was pretty mad at Saul and decided we needed to anoint a successor, and they, the, 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 uh, the runt of the litter of, uh, of a family that he was sent to was the last person brought in, turned out to be David, who got the anointment ahead of schedule, but Saul still had some, some governing to do, or so we thought, and was very envious of David, and I remember it, it, uh, his son Jonathan uh, saw, uh, became good friends with David and warned David, that Dad's out to kill you. Uh, and uh, so, uh, sadly, Jonathan, though, was killed in battle with his dad, and, and David uh, took over as king. David was not so perfect, and uh, Bathsheba was the, the uh, woman he wanted to have a, a relationship with. A, uh, I mean, I think what, what was extramarital in those days, even, even this was still, and he had a his, pretty full band guard. And one of his lieutenant's wives, no less. U yeah. Uriah, I think, yeah. was the name, Uriah. right? Yeah, and Uriah, he, he basically sent his lieutenant out to battle and then told the troops to retreat and left this poor guy out there to be slaughtered. And uh, David didn't look so good, you know, and that's supposed to be, you know, this revered, uh, you know, so it's the house of David, so it's the messianic house and everything, and yet still, uh, our leaders aren't perfect. At one of our CEO summits, we had a, a noted, um, uh, a noted humanity scholar, I'll, I'll describe him rather than name him, because if I name him, I can't describe him, but <laughs> he had so much affect, he made the, we the rest of we uh, academics look normal. Uh, he, he kept <laughs> opening up a water bottle and, and taking a sip like, like a little athletic cap, and because he was uh, uh, apparently taking a mix of medicines that was making him uh, uh, dehydrated. But uh, he would punctuate every sentence with opening up this water bottle again, but each time he did, it was like he never had seen one of these contraptions before. <laughs> so finally the CEOs were screaming at him each time, how do you just pull the lip up already? Uh, but, he, but, but one woman in the room, I'll tell you, it was Martha Stewart, said, uh, but Professor, uh, as you're talking about Shakespeare, and, and uh, we're looking at Kierkegaard and Dante and things, but especially Shakespeare, said, you, you're presenting them all as, um, as, uh, as flawed. And Professor Harold Bloom, don't quote me, says, well, you don't get it, woman, don't you? Is Shakespeare hated all of you people? It wasn't accidental. He thought leaders are all flawed. And, you know, so there are, people aren't perfect, whether or not we're looking at Shakespeare or, or the Bible, the people we, we love. Is, if you look at Joseph Campbell, and what I was doing up there was, was stealing from Joseph Campbell. It was a leader of a thousand faces. You've ever read it. In this day of postmodernism on campus, of course, and we're supposed to, we, of course, do live in this world where, we don't believe in you know, hierarchies of civilization anymore and things like that, is yet still, uh, with all the cultural relativism out there to understand each culture on its own terms, we're not supposed to say that there are cultural universals, but this Joseph Campbell, the, the, who wrote The Hero of a Thousand Faces, went against the grain, and a lot of anthropologists politically didn't like him, but he said there are some cultural universals, and the hero myth is one. And I suppose, you know, I'm, we can't, include Muhammad in this list or else we'll never make it out safely to the parking lot, so I won't int introduce that. <laughs> but, but, but Jesus, Moses, uh, Abu Buddha, you know, Siddhartha was, was uh, you know, the, shed the princely airs to go walk with the masses. They had to prove the common touch, and that's in the recipe for all. And then an aunt, an uncle, a parent, a, a, a mother, a, a, a father, some coach, a teacher, somebody whispers, but honey, you're different. The, you can make a difference in the world, but then they have to separate themselves from society, and you have those trials uh, out there, and that's where the HR community leaves off. We're on, we're on that conveyor belt at that point, a success spiral. But it's only after the crushing setback 
that the person is going to make it. Uh, uh, that's the punctuating moment. Uh, that's where you prove it. And most of us don't make it through. Those of us who have had those setbacks and you make it through, you're tempered by it, you're challenged, your character is proven. You know, people see if you have a, a twisted sense of humor, you can uh, you know, work on that. Uh, uh, but you, you define yourself by the future, not the past. And even the Donald, I have to give him credit for this, that, that, you know, that will to go on. And that's the resilience. And that's a, a, a very, I think, divine spiritual point. That that's how we get through these tough times. And that's what the world wants to see in leaders is somebody who can see what's bigger and better out there. A very spiritual man that I, I admire in many ways and, and don't admire in some other ways, uh, Jimmy Carter, who was a colleague of mine at Emory, mm. he's, a, you know, he's, a, he's a great human being in a lot of ways, but that the, um, the sense of, he never said the word malaise in the malaise speech, but still was a sense that there's no larger than life vision that he had out there, despite all that tremendously authentic spiritual anchoring and sense of humility he had. People also wanted to see that, okay, you can, there's a sense of belief and yeah, how we get through it all and not the hand wringing angst that, that people felt. So I think that uh, that's what's really, I don't mean to go on so long on this one, but. No, well, you know, in, in fact, for those who spend a little time poking around the, the Bible, uh, whichever uh, Bible you use, the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, whatever, almost. Well, the Quran, the, we want to get in our cars tonight. You know? <laughs> this is true. Pick your text. The, the great heroes that we talk about, say King David or Moses, all of them are flawed individuals. Moses was a convicted felon on the run. David was an adulterer and murdered one of his lieutenants. I mean, you go through the list, and, and it's an extraordinary narrative that, yes. Esau would have some unpleasant things to say about, uh, about Jacob, wouldn't he? Yeah. Exactly. And in fact, there, for, the, for those who are the historians of the text, there, there was only one perfect king that God ever describes. That was King Josiah. And all the others were flawed in various ways. So I, frankly, I find that heartening. That, that means there can be, we can, as you say, fire back. We can re-anchor. We can grow. We can learn and, and uh, try again. Let me open it to questions. Who'd like to ask Jeff something? First one in the back. I see you. Just uh, shout as loud as you can if you don't mind. And what's your name? Sorry. Hi, Joe. John, John Pottery. Question about self-awareness. My experience is that the most successful CEOs have a high degree of self-awareness, and it's so easy to glorify a CEO. Can you talk a little bit about the... That is such so a CEOs, huge theme. I, I could, I could uh, bore... 80% of this room uh, through till breakfast is on a that. question for great CEOs. Self-awareness, yeah, thanks for re recasting it. Is, uh, there's a grandiosity. You know, if you want to know uh, those of you who are, who are CEOs in the room or uh, C-suite types and things, that you've chosen to make trade-offs in your lives and become public figures. And you know how you take the arrows on and you make certain sacrifices. There's a, there is, part of this is fueled by a heroic mission. It's a belief that you want to leave a lasting legacy. But something independent to mention is heroic stature. This is the notion that, uh, I mean, uh, nobody ever told Alexander III of Macedonia that he was uh, Alexander the Great until he and his mom created this whole <laughs> false uh, in mythology and a fake lineage to Odysseus and Achilles and things. And he started to believe it himself, and that's the dangerous part, is that heroic identity is that people, you know, you, you look at the biographies, and I used to, uh, uh, again, uh, out of uh, bizarre uh, 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 masochism, used to teach a careers course at Harvard, uh, I'd, and I would require, it was really masochistic, a careers paper, a uniquely written, you know, 60-page paper on all these instruments. It was hard because you had no grading template or rubric to use. It was ridiculous. I think that's how I gained a lot of that weight, was rewarding it by every five one of these essays to get through it, having to read hundreds of these things in a short period of time to get the grades in, is uh, that these very successful people would take tragedy and they would find, you know, they were their Peace Corps worker that was somewhere in Peru and the, the, uh, uh, the truck of logs rolled over with a bunch of kids that were riding on it with them taking a, a, a fun lark and all the kids are killed and the Peace Corps worker survives and she has to explain to the parents why she survived. And they find somehow a positive angle in all this. Uh, Andy Young, who, uh, Andrew Young, of course, who was, who was a um, a minister, a congregational minister, actually, uh, as well as a UN ambassador and a mayor of Atlanta and things. After the Atlanta Olympics, uh, nobody knew how to speak. I was there at the time, and I was working at the Olympics as a consultant to them. Uh, Billy Payne, head of the Olympics, didn't want to say anything. The president surely didn't want to say anything. Uh, the head of IBM, Lou Gerstner, they're all up there on stage, head of at and Nobody knew what to say after the bombing at Centennial Olympic Park when they decided to regroup. And I, I should have brought this video because it's so, it's, it's too biblical, to, it's too over the top, in fact, even to be biblical, let alone Hollywood, is it was clouding and raining. As Andy Young spoke, 
honest to God, and I mean it literally honest to God, the clouds parted, the light came through. It's, it's, uh, it, and what he talked about was, um, and he got the names of the victims right, it was the only thing he had written down. He just talked though basically uh, about redemptive qualities of suffering and how all religions make some sense out of suffering. It was very powerful. And, they, and look at what we appreciate is that we didn't have fighting. People all parts of the world getting along and how this was a People's Olympics with all of its chaos and everything else. People walked out of there so uplifted, feeling great. They were scared coming in and it was like being in Midtown Manhattan or Times Square, you know, uh, uh, during the ball drops. Uh, shoulder to shoulder, but nervous, uh, a carpet of humanity, they walk out uplifted. There are oh. people tears streaming down. The power of words and perspective is sort of what you see there. And I think that kind of self-awareness, a guy named Andy, Andy Young like that, was able to summon a life skills when he needed it. He knew what his oratory strengths were, and he, he knew he didn't need a written speech, speech to do it. Uh, Dennis Kozlowski didn't have that vision, you know, some of you know that I'll name names, is he, uh, or John Regas, a member of Delphi, these are some people who are very talented but forgot where their pocket stops and ours starts, and that sense of grandiosity would overwhelm some, toga party or not, they start to really believe that somehow uh, uh, they deserve more than others, and that, that grandiosity, sense of losing themselves is really hard for those of you in high office, which is many of you in here, you know that the office itself cuts you off as couriers of bad tidings are afraid to sometimes tell you the truth. The messengers don't get to you. I've got a, a clip I could show you when we gave Jamie Dimon our, our Legend of Leadership Award. He talked about how important it is uh, that he, he there was a, a speaker on just before him who said you have to have one person always as your truth teller will speak truth to power. And Jamie looked back at her and said, I don't know what you're talking about. Only one person? If only one person on my management team, I would fire the other ten. <laughs> And then look what happened to him three years later with this uh, Ina Drew, his CIO. I don't know that she maliciously misled him. She was losing control herself in the whole London Whale thing. He was, there was no malice there. It was ridiculous to punish the shareholders more. The government was completely ridiculous in what they did to J.P. Morgan. But still, ironic, tragic irony that Jamie, of all people, who was so self-aware on this point, you can be self-aware and still catches up on you. People need to figure out how you constantly complement your, your weaknesses with others out there. To, to make up for them, and some, they, you get cut off, the couriers are bad time, you don't want to come to you. Also, a lot of you are just really busy, you know, not as reflective, and you know, it, David and I, you know, uh, the sun goes up and goes down, if we get our laundry done some days, we've had a, a full day, you people are very <laughs> transactions oriented, aren't as reflective and contemplative, so it's hard to, to be self-aware, and also people, uh, you know, they do wonder, sort of the reverse of the Job story. Some people are aware that they feel like Job and you're the Almighty. They say, well, who am I to, to, to challenge them anyway, so. You know, you talk about Jamie Dimon. We had uh, Greg Page, the now retired uh, chairman and CEO of Cargill here, and he talked about that same point using different words. He said, I asked him that question. I said, how do you find truth towers? He said, well, I have mirrors. And I said, what, what do you mean mirrors? And I thought he meant the executive bathroom or something. He said, no. He said, from the, from the Gospel of John, there's a, there's a verse that talks about needing mirrors in your life to reflect back what, what you may not see. And he said, I have 14 mirrors. And he could name them all. Some he started the business with, and others were just people who had chutzpah and would tell him what was going on. And he said, that's, that's what I need. Without that, I will delude myself. Mm. Another okay. question, and thank you for that being such a short question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, and you were, you were Betsy. This is Betsy McCoy, as you know, uh, the healthcare wizard, former lieutenant governor of New York, and that's just the beginning of it. Uh, thank you, Betsy. Yeah. What I wanted to point out is that I've read this article. It's the firing back, the one in your seats, yep. It's one of the best articles I've ever read. So don't oh, go gosh, home thank you. <laughs> Here's five dollars. Thank you. But this article gives you so many practical, important steps and how to begin to recover from a career crisis. We've all had them or will have them. So don't go home without reading the article. <laughs> Audrey, so Jeff, Jeff, Audrey give, thank give, you for copying it. Audrey's the one who violated copyright from Harvard Business Review. Copy. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Jeff, what are, what are two things that are resilience? When of our own making or if, if the truck runs us over, what are two things that help us be resilient that you would offer us? Well, don't away? listen to your friends and PhD psychologists and others so, who tell you like tomorrow's Job. another day. <laughs> yeah, exactly like Job. Yeah. They're blaming you for it. Yeah. Is, uh, you've got to come to terms with it. Okay. Uh, and uh, none sweep it under the carpet. A lot of people will think, oh, maybe nobody will notice. They notice, they just don't talk about it. You, now you, so you, you don't want to uh, uh, belabor it, you know, and a lot of times you have a friend that you ask 
ask them, how are you? And then they go on with two hours telling you, you wish you hadn't asked. <laughs> but there's still a way to find out uh, how do you deal with the source of the problem? It's, it's like uh, people who say, well, take some stress therapy, some relaxation. That's coping mechanisms are wrong. And in fact, the current research on post-traumatic stress disorder tells us most of what PhD psychologists practice is wrong is that sublimation. It's like telling somebody who's, who's got a drug problem, have you tried alcohol? You go for the source <laughs> of the problem. And, and that's one. A another is- And real quick so we can get another question in. Whoever you're meeting tonight, uh, stay in touch with them. There's a huge amount of research on this. I'm sorry to say at Stanford, uh, 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 guy Mark Granovetter, used to be at Harvard. Uh, it's called the strength of weak ties or uh, is signaling theory is there, is that, uh, is that the, your intimate friends, people around you, they're great for support. Uh, but they don't have a network that connects beyond you. It's the people you meet here that maybe aren't intimate friends, but they get you outside your immediate circle. They can, they're not competitive with you. They're not judging you. They can help you. It's a, it's a, that's, that's another, and I guess a third quick one is, uh, when you see these celebrities and others are going off to rehab or they're saying, gosh, if I offended somebody, whatever, you can't straddle. You have to, what's your strategy? If you did something wrong, uh, then you've got to go for uh, contrition and, uh, uh, and apologize, make good on it, uh, uh, atone for it. If you think you didn't, then scream it from the mountaintop and show us the evidence. I, I think Martha tried to do both. I, don't th I think Martha actually didn't do anything wrong. I think she tried to do something wrong and didn't succeed at it. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that uh, it, it was a very hard I, I think that uh, nobody believed her story, uh, except for me. I don't, uh, they, the threads of her story didn't hang together, but the threads for square ends of her goods hung together yeah. very well. And her stuff was selling really well. And it was 26-year-old ad buyers who lost faith in her, but her yeah. customers stayed with her and ultimately was really resurgent. I like your point. If, if you really think you're innocent, scream it from the rooftops. If you did something wrong, admit it, be contrite, redemption, right. et cetera. Another question. Way in the back. Yeah. Sorry, what's your name? I can't see. Hey, Charles. How are you doing? Charles, Charles how are you? So uh, I can vouch for the CEO summits because I was at the very Jamie Dimon summit that Jeff just spoke about. Former president of the Pension Benefits Guarantee Corporation. And at that summit, that David pulled me aside and said, would you be an interviewee at GLF, which happened many years ago? Um, and Jeff has been helpful to me because I'm going to be teaching a class at Yale Business School this semester and I want to ask you a very specific question about that that relates to tonight. You talked about things like the man for all seasons, you talked about classics and how you can try to, you know, the, the Lord of the Flies and a number of other references. Uh, my class is about pensions and so my first reading is King Lear. How do we feel about old? Real quick, what's your question, Charles? My question is, I like it already though. <laughs> my question is how do you explain, how do you, Jeff Sonnenfeld, how do you feel about whether capitalism is good or holy or something uplifting or is it simply just a means to an end? You, Jeff Sonnenfeld, what do you think? Sonnenfeld's view on capitalism as a spiritual adventure or just, uh, does it have a good to it? Well, you know, you can, this has been a long talk, but you can get to it through, to, through Weber and understanding uh, the, the, the Protestant ethic and, you know, what it means uh, to be uh, able to, to, to recreate and to start again and to not be preordained to failure and capitalism as a, uh, not just a, a source of, of efficiency, but you can see it as, a, as, a, as a, a system of justice. We like to trash the word bureaucracy even more than we trash the word cap, uh, capitalism. The theory of bureaucracy was to get away from capricious coattail effects on bosses and bullying or dynastic family control of things. and. Uh, this is a way of uh, capitalism breaks an old order and, and, and gives, uh, the theory of it is, is equal opportunity, equal justice, and if you believe that uh, God has created all people equal, that this is the system. But. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Phil was it, right? Uh, yeah, Phil Liefman. Welcome, Phil. Thank you very much, and thank you. This has been enlightening and fun. Oh, thank you. And fast. I'll be quick. And, uh, Mark Twain uh, said, uh, uh, all conversations are primarily with myself, and then sometimes they happen to include other people. <laughs> but I have a, uh, a friend, Harvard Moore, who uh, is one of these people who have fallen from grace uh, in a big way during the SNL crisis, and uh, after the disgrace became, earned back his, um, his, his attorney stature, his right to hold a gun, and so forth in Texas, all important things. And, and he talks about the moment in the decision where you go from ethical and on course to suddenly finding yourself where you never thought you would be. Hmm. He talks about it entering federal penitentiary, as the case were. And, and, and the question that I have is, 
that moment of decision where we make errors usually doesn't happen while everyone is looking. It generally happens when no one is looking, and the trick to, to heroic leadership in, in, in driving people to that is often, how do I uh, have enough people watching me so that I'm not sliding away from uh, wherever I should be towards what's easy or sometimes difficult? That epiphany question is a really tough one. I know David doesn't want to spend too much time on one question. Just in a word the question. But in, in, you know, in, in essence, it's really how do you not start keep making small concessions and things snowball? And I see that so happen. I, I ask our students every year how many of you, you know, we talk about situations where they have to masquerade as, as, rec as recruiters uh, uh, to start asking for competitive information out of other companies. And little by little, they'll make concessions. They really they get to a place where they don't want to be, and they'll, they'll blame it. I'll get uh, 25 to uh, roughly 40% of our students will admit that they were put in those situations and didn't know how to control it, how to stop it. So somehow it's to, it's to anticipate and to be aware. I don't believe you can, you can, business schools need to be teaching ethics per se, but ethical awareness, ethical logics, decision making. How do you know what trade-offs you're making and to anticipate through different vignettes, case studies, whatever, how do you know when you're getting trapped into those kinds of mushrooming concessions? I think that's a, a really a, a important question and, uh, and not by the time you wind up in, in an SNL uh, fraudulent fiasco that Dave Mullins has to unravel for us, which is what, by the way, Dave did as he not only fixed the SNL crisis but gave us the circuit breakers that for a while fixed our markets. Uh. <laughs> But you know that, that point, Phil. In some ways, that's what we're. That's our quest here. That talking about it, taking it out of the closet, uh, putting light on the issue. Uh, I believe in the way I think about ethics is just like we can have physical fitness or maybe spiritual fitness. We can have ethical fitness, and it comes from practicing, role playing, anticipating. One of your colleagues and uh, our friends, uh, uh, Barry Nailbuff, does something uh, with uh, with his children. I, well, I guess they're out of the home now. But every Sunday, they would read the Sunday New York Times in the magazine. You know, there's an ethics column. Is it by Barry Cohen? I forget who writes it. And they would read that as a fan and then he would ask his daughters, what do you think of that? That's ethical fitness, practicing, working at it. And there are ways that you can start making the concessions you wonder when you take a look at certain deals like uh, uh, Valiant, Allergan, and uh, the whole sort of unfolding where people wind up on um, uh, three sides of a four-sided table. You wonder, well, you know, you don't understand how this happened, but is, you know, is this right? And maybe it's not inside trading, but is it appropriate? And, uh, you, you can start to go down that path. I, I don't uh, know, in, uh, uh, Mr. Cooper, if you want to say uh, just a word about Chief Executive Magazine coming out this issue. <laughs> I have an article called, in there, um, Activism Inside Out, uh, which was sort of just taking a look at, uh, while I, I think that the activists have done a lot of great things at a lot of great companies that, that needed a kick in the pants from you know Home Depot to uh, Hewlett Packard. There are an awful lot of others that have been uh, destroyed from you know uh, the Motorola and other places were misguided and you have this shrieking irony where you've got a, a 60 billion dollar com company. This is a final answer to Charles Millard's question about the pearls of, of capitalism. Is the short termism as a value set is a real problem. Uh, is going into Thanksgiving holiday, we had Michael uh, Dell on every network that would listen to him, screaming from his mountaintop how great it is to be a private company uh, and that he can make the investments that all of his competitors have been forced to shed uh, parts of the, the IT equ uh, equation. He's able to do it all, but here he is, he's running a $60 billion company reaching 220 countries, technology driven. Another $60 billion company was being pursued in a witch hunt uh, technology-driven company. A guy I like a lot, Dan Loeb, I think had a bad w w call in vilifying Andrew Liveris of Dow, which was uh, fantastic, you know, uh, highest returns of, of any integrated chemical company, uh, while the Chinese sit back and laugh uh, at, at our short-termism, Charles, which is a problem with capitalism, is that uh, Li Ronggong, the former head of SASAC, uh, told me about uh, two years ago uh, at a session, SASAC, which is the 117 standard enterprises in China that are not converting anymore to private, they, they were 12 years ago all converting into uh, public companies, they stopped. They say not because we're, we're trying to, uh, to corner markets and conspire, and maybe there's still is some of that, by the way, anyway, but still, they're saying no, it's because we can make long-term investments uh, you folks aren't able to do that. We have patient capital, and that is, there are some problems uh, having to do with time frame, which may be, just given time frame, we don't have time to get into tonight, but there is, we talk about some other point. Right. Well, I think our time is winding up. Uh, Jeff, you, you've just been extraordinary, and I could oh. sit at your feet and listen all evening long. How about a round of applause for Jeff? Oh, thanks.